Okay, everyone, thanks for coming. I think we'll get started. So good afternoon and welcome to this panel discussion on how to grow as a professional in the emerging discipline of biomimicry. For those of you new to the topic, biomimicry is the practice of learning from nature to reveal new and innovative design solutions. Biomimicry Alberta is our local group with networks across Canada and internationally. If you'd like to connect with us, you can sign up for our newsletter on our website, or you can find us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn under Biomimicry Alberta or Biomimicry AB. Carlos, can you paste that link in the chat? There's some resources there for those of who you who would like to connect with us and learn more. The panel discussion today will be hosted by Marianne. De Dr. Egermont is a teaching professor and faculty member in the mechanical and manufacturing department of the Schulich School of Engineering, University of Calgary. She is a co-founder of Biomimicry Alberta, which brings you this presentation today. And she is also the co-founder of Zygote Quarterly and continues to contribute as a designer to this online journal, which is a beautiful mix of science and art. You can see some of the past covers here. A teacher, an artist, and an all around lovely person. Please welcome Marianne. Thank you, Kira, for that uh, very kind introduction and uh, welcome everyone. I uh, hope everybody's doing well and feeling healthy and sticking with our, our current uh, scenario. Um, for this next hour, we'd like to sort of take you on a path of uh, exploring biomimicry in terms of uh, what you might uh, be able to do uh, in terms of a professional capacity. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Jamie Miller is going to be our first speaker in this series of slides. Hopefully that's correct, yes. Um, so let me introduce Jamie and then I will let him uh, take it away. So each of our uh, panelists will uh, speak to some slides for a few minutes. Um, if you have questions for them, uh, please put them in the chat and uh, Carlos and Kira will keep an eye on your questions. And after their presentations, we will dive into those questions and uh, find out more uh, about what each of the three individuals uh, on the panel today are up to. So Jamie is the founder of Biomimicry Frontiers. It's an award-winning sustainability consultancy based out of Guelph, Ontario. And he earned his PhD in engineering um, at the University of Guelph, focusing on system level biomimicry and urban resilience. And he was also the director of the biomimicry program at OCAT University, uh, which is in Toronto. Jamie has recently started the Biomimicry Commons, an education and incubation platform, uh, which Fast Company called a rule-changing idea in 2019. Uh, he's a two-time TEDx speaker and was named a new centurion by the David Suzuki Foundation. And I asked him if that came with a fancy outfit, but it didn't, um, but he was able to meet uh, David and uh, other centurions. So hopefully he'll talk more about that, but uh, let's hear from Jamie. Thank you so much, Marianne. Um, thanks so much for the invitation, Biomimicry Alberta. It's a real pleasure to be here virtually. Um, I want to spend just my quick time here talking about frontiers, our consulting, but primarily the way that we integrate biomimicry into design. So as Marianne um, mentioned, we're a sustainability consultancy. Uh, we primarily, we're incorporated in 2017, so we're almost four years old, and we primarily work at systems level biomimicry. So we work with landowners and developers, architects, um, homeowners, um, applying systems-based biomimicry, but we will also apply form-based stuff. To give you an example, a house that we're designing in India to um, encourage more passive cooling, we looked at elephant skin and copied the way that elephant skin crevices can capture moisture, which evaporates over a longer period of time because of the shading. And um, we use that technology to design a facade that when connected to the rainwater or the rain harvesting system, 
could trickle water through and passively cool or evaporatively cool over a longer period of time. So we will use form-based stuff, but we're primarily systems-based uh, thinkers. Um, next slide, please. But what I'm, what I found in, in my in my work is, um, and what I studied in my PhD is is really the relationship between our thinking and our designs. Why are humans so different from the rest of the natural world? And really exploring our paradigms. And so that's one of the biggest barriers I found to the application of biomimicry is that we have inherited a status quo way of doing things, which is based on older assumptions um, for how to relate to the natural world. So things like Newtonian science or material paradigm, these ideas that we are separate from nature or that we can control nature um, or that nature is there for infinite youth, use um, for our infinite growth. So um, a lot of what we do is, is we work with our partners, whether they're architects or landowners or designers or developers, um, and exploring some of those paradigm barriers, those barriers. Um, and that's really where we see the evolution of our design thinking, well, obviously thinking, but uh, the evolutions of our designs is in, in the changing of our thoughts. And so um, the, the big challenge and the question that we, we wrestle with is how do we disrupt patterns of behavior? Um, and it's first to really become present to what it is, what are the paradigms that we're using to design with. And so um, I'm, I stand in the position that how we think isn't wrong, that there is no right or wrong, it's just perhaps outdated. So these old ideas of Newtonian science that really inform how we do design um, just might be a little bit outdated. So how do we convince people who are inherently afraid of like unknown and change? How do we convince them to adopt a new paradigm? And that's the real um, trick. And, and so with our consulting, um, we do a lot of practice on, on that mindset, like working in relationship with these people to, to see from a different lens and then to give practical application. And that's the real challenge is how do we practically apply from this new lens? And how do we prove to these old thinkers, I'll say, um, not in a derogatory way, how do we prove to these thinkers that this new way is, is not only uh, sustainable and um, uh, profitable, but it, it's the, you know, a better way of doing things. And so that's a lot of what we do is we do apply economics to our designs to try and prove to the capitalists that, yeah, you can do this and it will save you money in the long term. Um, I'd say one of the biggest lessons is helping people project longer term. And that's one of the key th things that we've been able to identify as a, a point of um, uh, helping people think differently is to give them long-term economic viewpoints so that they can see how they'll save money or generate money over a longer term, especially when we're looking at resiliency and how things are going to be disrupted. So next slide, please. So yeah, this is the idea is how do we confront um, thinking and, and create from a new paradigm. Um, from all the work that we've done, we've actually built an online course. So through the education at OCAD, through the application, through Biomimicry Frontiers, I don't know if you can hear my boy in there screaming, but it's nap time. Um, we have an online course that's being launched in January and we're looking for the first cohort of people. And in this course, we wanna really walk through the methods for how to uh, shift your thinking. So the biomimicry mindset, and we'll look at current paradigms and the current assumptions that we use to not make them wrong or right, but just to be able to view them so that you're conscious of them. And then from there, we do offer the methodology, um, the practical application of biomimicry, and we'll challenge you to create a product or solution or turn your business biomimetic in the third module. So that's coming up in January. And if you're interested in being in this first cohort um, to really push this, um, please check out our website, um, which is on that slide there, or feel free to reach out to me. All right, thanks so much. Thank you, Jamie. And um, for our next speaker, we have uh, Anne-Marie Daniel, and uh, she is a partner at uh, Nature R&D. Um, over a career as a mediator, highlighting the problems facing people and the planet, Anne-Marie has a deep belief in people's creative spirit and desire to have a lifestyle that is in sync with nature. 
uh, with some extra help in the form of teamwork, talent, and tools. She believes we can design our way out of this planetary mess if everyone brings their piece of the puzzle. Uh, Anne-Marie holds a BFA in theater design, a graduate certificate in mediation, and a master's in biomimicry, and is also a certified biomimicry professional. Welcome, Anne-Marie, and the floor is yours. Thanks very much, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to be here with you all. Uh, I'm calling in from uh, Vancouver Island, the Wasanic uh, territories and uh, territories of the Lekwungen speaking people. Um, it's uh, nice to see a variety of disciplines on this call, people from a variety of backgrounds, because uh, this is one of the things that has um, really been so uh, um, inspiring and helpful in my uh, practice of biomimicry. I discovered it in about 2004 uh, and I um, at the moment at that time was working as a mediator. We have a leadership development consultancy called the Roy Group. And one of the things I found along with Janine Benyus's talks was um, life's principles, which are uh, a series of principles that were developed by Biomimicry 3.8 um, to look at what are the deep patterns in nature. So while I was running more of a social type of business, I started to look at life's principles as a way of guiding my business. So what can I learn from the deep patterns in nature um, that might help me uh, amplify uh, what I was offering to the world in that service. And um, for any of you who are not familiar with Life's Principles, I'd encourage you to check it out because, uh, and it is linked in the chat, thank you, Carlos, um, as a way of uh, giving yourself a good series of questions around your business. And indeed, because our business is about leadership development and mindset shifts, as Jamie was uh, alluding to, uh, there's a lot of good questions around, are you cultivating the right feedback loops? Do you have good cooperative relationships? Are you leveraging the cycles that are um, both in nature and um, in your community and in your clients? Um, and uh, what things are you doing that you know you're going to repeat because that's a strategy that works, but where are the opportunities to uh, broaden your thinking? Um, really important themes like being locally attuned and responsive and adapting to changing conditions. So as a way to simply practice even before developing a product, um, uh, biomimicry, you can bring it in in this kind of social innovation space. Anyway, after um, doing some of that and then going deep into the study of biomimicry, I'm now at the point where um, I've launched my own business, uh, Nature R&D, and uh, we have a website there. And what I'm really looking to do uh, with Nature R&D is uh, help the average person, the business owner, start to think in, uh, in terms of uh, the solution space that nature offers. So there's a number of these uh, type of games on my website where you can look at why is nature using the shapes she's using and start to uh, be able to see nature rather than just um, feel and appreciate. So to get past that um, uh, just appreciation into a place of curiosity and then really starting to think what are some of these deeper design patterns even in forms that we can apply to uh, our human environment. Um, so, as I said, it, it's about uh, nature R&D is really hoping to engage people um, in coming through the door of looking at this solution space that nature um, provides to connect and find and see it. Um, and uh, given that I have a background as a mediator, I've actually started to put my feelers out in a number of directions from how can this change the way we uh, design municipalities to how can we bring this more into the education system. Uh, one of the areas of life principles that um, 
was not built out as much as I needed to understand it was life-friendly chemistry. And so one of the first things I did was uh, create an, an immersion and invite Biomimicry 3.8's chemist, Mark Dorfman, uh, to come on an eight-day immersion in India and really start to help us understand um, this, what seems to be a very uh, difficult world of organic chemistry. But given that nature uses a select number of elements, what can we learn about her recipes, her recipes, which is going to be a huge piece of how we align our designs. Maybe the next slide, please. And so I've tripped into an awesome opportunity. We also have Adina Dar on the call, I believe, who is also on this team. Uh, but their uh, RCD, Rainchild Design, brought, has brought together all of these companies to look specifically at um, the issue of flexible film packaging. And we are taking a biomimetic approach to looking at how can we improve the performance of compostable flexible film packaging by looking to nature for design ideas. So uh, this is a great opportunity for people to start looking through the lens of how does nature do packaging. Next slide, please. Uh, we looked at, you know, the current state um, and uh, the reason we focus in this space is that our oceans are really threatened by this design issue. Next slide, please. And um, here are just a few examples. As you know, as you know uh, nature does packaging very well and nature can do transparent packaging. Uh, nature's packaging is multifunctional, it uh, is time phased, it's often single use, but it's uh, highly biodegradable and something that nature um, uh, uses in her system. So indeed, we're looking at not only how can we uh, design a compostable flexible film that copies some of these strategies, but how can we design it with materials that nature would thank us for. Uh, that will improve actually the soil when it gets composted. So uh, looking both from a form, a process and looking at it as a systems level, which has been um, mm. incredibly heartening given that uh, all these companies are involved. And do I have one more slide? It would appear not. It would appear not. Well, so then I'm sure I've taken five minutes. I guess the last thing I wanna say is um, back to this idea of everybody um, in, in different disciplines. One of, the th you know, uh, one of the things I learned early as a mediator is that the people are the experts on the problem and my uh, strengths are more in the facilitation. And indeed by getting a, a um, group of people who see a problem many different ways and have, having uh, nature as the expert in the room, um, that's the place where you get this new story going forward. So uh, a big part of um, advancing biomimicry in business is going to be uh, precisely through these networks that Biomimicry Alberta is facilitating here and indeed that we need more of across Canada. Great, thanks Anne-Marie. And uh, I believe Kira was also on that chemistry uh, trip and um, Kira created a fabulous uh, chemistry handout, which I was lucky enough to have access to. And uh, perhaps that's also in the resource uh, list. Um, so our final panelist, um, last but not least, is uh, Omar El Zahawi, uh, who's an architectural design manager, uh, project manager, um, with 25 over 25 years of international experience in the architectural industry. He holds a master's in architecture with uh, an approach specialized in comparing primitive pattern-based architecture to structures built by organisms. His passion in studying the relation of form and nature led him to generate and develop a multitude of creative and sustainable designs inspired by the process of biomimicry, creating spaces that focuses on improving the well being of communities. Omar, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Marianne. Uh, thank you, uh, 
Biomimicry Alberta for giving me this opportunity to share uh, some of my uh, uh, career interaction with biomimicry. Hopefully people on uh, whoever is joining can benefit from. Uh, so what I'm gonna be focusing on uh, uh, two examples where um, the ecosystem was more involved in the unmeasurable aspect. So this was one of the example, it's supposed to be a warehouse in an industrial area in Abu Dhabi, but it turned out to be the flagship of Toyota. Now, the reason why is the, uh, the process, during the design process, we looked into inspiration from nature and we went into the pattern of winds and the force of winds and how do they impact um, and shape forms in nature and vice versa, how they do that, they implement that force and studying the aerodynamics in the car and so on and so forth. But what I, what I wanna bring here is when we started looking at that pattern and we uh, dived into the design process, usually there is an unmeasurable part when you design something out of nothing. There is no guidance, there is no book to tell you that this is gonna be the end product. And this is like uh, clearly defined in the architectural, I mean, uh, criticism and philosophy, it's where there's a hidden aspect in the design, the unmeasurable. So what I wanna say here is like, when you see the, your instinct, you're, you're on the right path, I call it the, the, the design starts solving itself by itself. It evolves because the reason why the inspiration is coming from nature. When your pattern is coming from nature, you expect a high quality product. For instance, here, this was, a, uh, we used uh, we ended up using the standing seam system to cover that wavy shape of the of the roof, which actually it addresses a lot of challenging environmental uh, future maintenance, the hot weather, the dry joint, and so on and so forth. Not to mention the constructability part of it. And you can see even the interior; it was a source of inspiration to the interior designer when they came on board. Uh, so, uh, what I what I'm focusing here is when you interpret it, when you interpret patterns from nature, you're gonna expect a lot of like uh, added values that come in during your design process moving forward, which I call it, it starts healing itself by itself. Uh, another example, when we started, I mean, I was uh, uh, dealing more with uh, the human aspect. We're designing for, for humans. What are the values? How can we bring and enhance values when interpreting patterns from, from, from nature. This was an interesting exercise lately done, design exercise. It's a, a, a cultural pavilion meant to be for uh, Dubai 2020. The source of inspiration was based on the, the human pattern and behavior and how do they move? How do they, people interact and, and, and come and spread the word? It's a, it's a venue for culture. So we expect people to come and, and uh, learn and interact and, and, and spread the word of that culture moving forward. And, and again, it's not the shape, it's, it's the process of design. When we, like, when we took like, different aspects and in, 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 in understanding deeply how the human behavior comes in and out and details, when we took this design to the detailed stage, we notice again, I mean, by instinct, where we're on the right path because it started also, I call it healing itself or resolving itself by itself because we, we noticed we were doing by default like uh, passive energy or uh, uh, at the same time. Now this comes back again, what I wanna bring the focus is the benefit of having nature your source of inspiration. And that's what really benefit uh, uh, a lot in my implementation and my uh, career path. And um, again, like speaking about, about the process, architecture is, is I, I, I see it as an part of an ecosystem. And this, um, the ecosystem, like it, 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 it includes inter interconnected inter relations between human, the environment, the space, the cultural aspects, not to mention the atmosphere, and you, you can take on and, and spread it, and that it goes on to the public realm, at, and so on and so forth. So the, the big lesson I, like, I wanna bring here is when, when you're relying on patterns that are proven 
in nature that are done in the best way and there are a lot to discover behind. So even if you start, the more you start, the more we start searching into it and the more deeply level, uh, as long as they, they become the source of inspiration, the end product is like, is guaranteed it's gonna come with a high quality, I call it product. Uh, thank you. Great, thank you Omar so much. And, and thank you to all three of our panelists for uh, such a nice variety of, of uh, professions and applications. Um, I'm gonna start with a question for Jamie. Uh, and this question comes from Carla and, and she asks, when does the aha moment happen with your clients, Jamie? Is there a pattern there? Yeah, the aha typically occurs early on through the storytelling. So when you start to frame things from a biomimetic lens and make those connections between the design world and the biology world, that's where the aha really happens and they get excited. And, and I said um, to this group earlier that we will use biomimicry kind of at the forefront. Um, it's very attractive and, it's, and it's, it helps us bridge the design and biology world. Where the next question always goes is in the practical application. They want to know how they'll do it and how we can do it um, uh, like financially responsibly, I guess I'll say. Like, how do we make money out of this is usually the second question. So the aha open moment happens early. Um, the practical application is where you have to get creative. Yeah, and that question has been on my mind um, in terms of, you know, I think at the same time, we need to talk about different economic models, right? Mm -hmm if we're trying to change this as a paradigm shift, right? Maybe something like uh, donut economics is a, a good model to show uh, where we're gonna make improvements and how we're gonna help both the social and environmental impacts of a design. Um, and Marie, I've got a question from you here. Um, uh, it was a comment in the chat, very interesting work. And um, this person is curious what the timelines and key milestones are for the packaging project. Yeah, no, it's a it's a really good question. Um, in the sense of, uh, you know, it's going to take money and R&D takes time. Uh, so the rough idea is that if you're going to develop a material, it usually or uh, bring something to market, it can take as much as 10 years. However, we're trying to do this in a shorter period of time um, by again using what are the readily available materials and energy or companies who are already somewhat down this path? How can we leverage um, the, the things that are already going on around us rather than uh, getting too proprietary and trying to do the whole thing ourselves? Um, so the timeline for the project, we expect to um, be prototyping certainly by the end of next year and um, in terms of the, the big collaborative, um, most of those projects have wound their way up and have resulted in a few strategies around um, creating more circular economies in terms of packaging. So there is a paper coming out in the next few weeks, um, a white paper on, on that uh, whole process of engaging that industry. There were 80 of us on a webinar every two weeks since February. Uh, so there was a big analysis of the system that's winding up in December and then um, the work going forward to uh, find new materials and uh, new ways of designing those materials through a biomimetic lens. I would say that's probably going to be prototyping at the end of the year and, um, and ideally uh, in the next five years having something that is um, tangible and on the market. Yeah, I would love I would love it if you could keep us posted on the white paper. Even uh, I'm sure people would find that interesting to to have a dive into that material. Uh, I know I would. So um, if you can keep us posted or send us a link, that would be great. We can share it with our audience today as well. Yeah. Um, Omar, uh, I'm going to combine uh, a sort of more general with a, a technical question, if you don't mind. Um, what are possibly some barriers in applying bio biomimicry in your field? 
And then a very specific uh, question that uh, refers to your slides uh, that asked, what about the safety on uh, roof maintenance right, against uh, falling? I think maybe that was referring to the big spans that you were showing in your uh, slides. Uh, right. So uh, maybe I'll ask, I'm um, sorry, I'll answer the second question first. So uh, the, the safety factor, I mean, this, this standing seam that covering the long span of that uh, wavy shaped uh, roof, um, it actually resolved the maintenance free uh, as, uh, situation for, for that roof. So access to that roof is only gonna be minimal just maybe yearly, on yearly basis, or unless there is like a damage uh, happened in, in, in a certain aspect. And uh, I recall, I mean, the, the team who worked on the detailing that uh, project and going on to the construction, I, uh, I think they added the rope access uh, uh, strategy because it's all based on, on a structural uh, uh, skeleton. Uh, but but what, I, what I wanna like, uh, draw the attention here to the architects. I mean, in terms of the quantum, it's basically the same quantum of material uh, used in, in, in building any warehouse, but it was just reformed in another shape. And we managed to produce uh, a shape that is uh, more efficient in terms of uh, uh, responding to the environment or accessibility or future maintenance and so on and so forth. But but I mean I mean uh, to answer that question they do come along with the with the with the approach itself so the design is, is totally uh, an approach to it. Um, com coming back to the biomimicry barrier, um, one of the main challenges I see it uh, is the understanding of of the word itself. What does it mean? What does it reflect? Uh, clients, uh, I mean for. We live in an era where the economical impact and the digital and AI it has more influence on shaping our cities, shaping our homes, shaping our lifestyle. And that's where it really comes in uh, the role of the architects and the designer, the urban planners, um, how to bring the human uh, values back again to and, 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 and have the real dimensions when designing the space and, and the positive impact on humans. Um, so, so the barrier now uh, is more coming to the, to the branding and the understanding of, of what is biomimicry about. Uh, it's not about the shape of the building. It, the shape comes, my, my personal uh, experience comes uh, as an, like part of the end product, but it's really the process itself the process that ends up with the, with the barrier. I see, I, I still see like the, uh, the biomimicry uh, uh, approach uh, is, is just started um, and thanks to biomimicry Alberta and there, I mean, and then Calgary and, and, and it's interesting to see this now becoming more of an academia based uh, uh, and I'm sure it's gonna take more um, time to have it more in, embedded in the practice, uh, like what uh, Jamie is doing and, and Anne. I mean, uh, I think the barrier, uh, it's, it's gonna take a long time to, to, to deal with it and, 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 and have real, the, the physical aspect uh, benefit out of it. Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna move to a question for Jamie. Um, and I was wondering about this myself. Uh, what kind of projects will students be doing for the upcoming online course? And are there any other tidbits that you can reveal that would be exciting for us to know? So for this first cohort, the founders group, we're actually um, calling on them to bring their own challenges. So we're going to walk through something that you're either interested in or currently working on, or if you own a company, um, the things that you're working on, and we're going to collectively just go through the the eight videos um, to unpack that to make it biomimetic to shift it in a bit. So that's what we're aiming for. Um, and if you have nothing, um, no problem. We could, uh, we do walk through the, the methods to help you get inspired by something. And for 
for the final module, I'll say we do spend time focusing on um, really identifying your purpose. So, um, and what we're calling inner biomimicry. So what is it that you're a natural at or that you're lit up by pairing that with what kind of the world needs some of the big issues, what could make you money? What does the market say? Um, really using that model to figure out where you can have the biggest impact. And we focus on your purpose because in my experience, um, I mean, my company is the evolution of tying biomimicry to something I'm very passionate about, which is land development and um, the, the harmony between engineering and, and nature. So when you have that alignment with your purpose, there's the energy and kind of fortitude to go at it because there are barriers that you're gonna come up against. But if you have that almost like, if you wanna call it a life purpose or this vision that you have, um, it's usually easier to stay on track and, and keep, keep at it. Um, so that's why we focus on that inner biomimicry part. That's great. Yeah, and I can't wait to hear sort of what happens in the first cohort. So I will be uh, keeping a close eye out. Yeah. Um, Anne-Marie, there's a question here. Um, uh, the question is, what are the newest and most promising discoveries in packaging materials based on biomimicry? Mm. I don't know if I can uh, rattle them off, uh, but I think you know one of the one of the things that um, is making a lot of sense is to use waste streams uh, that are natural materials. So we have a lot of waste from the processing of uh, seafood, and uh, and so using chitin and fish scales, uh, that's materials that we know nature can process. There's certainly a lot around um, cellulose and different fibers. Um, in India, they're making a lot of uh, flexible film packaging uh, for you know food to go um, out of sugarcane. Um, but it's really about the, um, the mixing of those ingredients and finding a formula that creates the right surface chemistry so that you get that, the kind of texture. There's lots of companies using texture right now, um, whether it's in like the Lotus and paints for self-cleaning, uh, whether it's in the seats of Ford, the new Ford vehicles are antiviral. So there's a there's a surface texture that uh, surfaces in nature are never flat. And so whatever the new packaging materials are, uh, they're also needing to have a surface texture uh, if they want to have a multifunctional design. Um, and then uh, the other thing that nature does is about gradients. So even though the conventional films and indeed many of our other uh, packaging that is compostable, we're, we're using this uh, this work of layering, but we're perhaps not using the textures and gradients that we could be in mimicking that part of what nature does. When you look at the cross section of a leaf or um, a shell or, or um, you know, uh, our own, I mean, humans are one big piece of packaging, uh, to look at those kind of textures and gradients and uh, put those in the materials. Indeed, we, we hope that we won't have, that we can use uh, things like a, a PHA, which is one of nature's first polyesters. Uh, you know, the first life forms were made out of something like a PHA, which is a essentially bug fat, but how but manipulate that in a way that um, it starts to uh, do manage moisture and oxygen better. Excellent. Yeah, and uh, I think yeah, in Canada we had a a research chair who was looking at um, the chitin from shrimp shells and making plastics out of that. Um, I think he was from, from the States, but had a lot of experience with that industry and with the remnants, turning that into packaging and uh, yeah, uh, biodegradable materials. Um, there's a question here uh, and I'm gonna split it up so that I can hear from Omar and then I can hear from Jamie. So if Omar and Jamie can both be attuned to uh, this question. Uh, this is from Ivan who says, I imagine that many solutions in multidisciplinary biomimicry leads to non-stream ideas like a shared economy or even form-based solutions not compliant to the applicable building codes and bylaws. 
uh, who do you work with to help discuss and address these challenges? So perhaps Omar could take care of the form-based solutions that might be uh, not compliant. And maybe Jamie can talk about shared economy ideas here. So Omar, if you want to start it off and then Jamie can take over. Sure, it's, a, it's an interesting, loaded, complicated question. <laughs> um, so speaking about the building code, I mean, we know codes, I mean, one of the challenges that create the codes, let's look at the pattern that is used to create the code. So I'm back to the process again. So the process of the building code is basically uh, based on a fit or a misfit. And that's been criticized long time ago, like from by uh, architects and philosophers and whether do you need a code to produce beauty? And I think the Romans were ahead in that line and they tried to produce a formula, the golden, uh, the golden uh, uh, ratio. And then Le Corbusier came in and then uh, Flank Road Light. And I'm sure a lot of tense of work and there are famous architects pilots who did projects worldwide and they thought this is it by creating a code but the reality when it comes uh, to the real product it didn't serve the end user because the users were not involved the reason why part of the code there is a high percentage of it it's subjective now when when you go to to architectural theory and design we usually rely on the vernacular architecture we rely on the the primitive architecture the reason why you find more of, of an objectivity to it which means a more of a natural response to the variable forces whether they're in nature ecological historical and so on and so forth that's why for instance the mesa verde in colorado it's a carved in from a cliff uh, village till now. It's a case study to all architects because how did that end up to be uh, energy saving and they're only using like uh, natural clay material. And so coming back to the code, uh, it's really a challenge to, to challenge the code unless you, you, you come with an alternative that can really convince the code needs to change. And I know this is a lot of happening in Canada and Toronto and downtown Toronto specifically and redesigning the city. I know there are architects who are heavily involved in introducing the new uh, wooden frame structures It got approved in, in BC. Also here in, in Toronto, there's a pilot project in downtown. So you can see when you go back to nature again, you have, it's, it's the answer, the trees, the, the, the 30 story high trees in, in, in Vancouver, they're a proven structure element. This is how it should be done. I mean, lightweight, you solve the seismic load and et cetera and so on. At, at, uh, coming back to the code again, it's, it's, it's a challenge and I think it's gonna remain a challenge unless I think it's, it's, it could be dealt by uh, a provincial level uh, decision makers in the city who are responsible in building the code, like the same they did for Alberta and introducing the new environmental uh, code um, and uh, regulations. Maybe Jamie, you can add to that. Yeah, thanks, Omar. Um, with reg I, I sent a link into the chat uh, of a video that I quickly put together last spring when COVID started um, ramping up in Canada and it explains the adaptive cycle. And I'm sure many of you or some of you have heard of the adaptive cycle, but I think it's an incredible model for how I perceive code and how we work with cities um, to deal with code. So a practical example is we're working on creating a circular food economy here in Guelph. And from that, we have had interdisciplinary collaborations come up with apps and applications that do confront challenge the code. One in, for example, is we've built an app here where my neighborhood is able to sell their backyard food produce. So if you've made too many cherry tomatoes, which I do every single year, you can sell them or donate them to your, your, your neighbors. Um, we, we just ran a pilot this year and we found that people wanted to share more than just their food, but also their honey or their compost or whatever. And, and that's where we hit the code barrier is that the city of Guelph doesn't allow any processed food to be sold. You have to be a, a registered business. Um, 
So it's like, and I totally get it. I get why, why code exists. Um, I also see that it can be a barrier. And in order to create evolutions, we have to make these small scale disruptions happen, which is what the adaptive cycle talks about. So make the disruption like Airbnb did um, in the hospitality industry or Uber did in transportation, those creative designs disrupted a system. And then you have to have code kind of follow suit and figure it out. So what we do is because we're working on a city project, we're working hand in hand with the policymakers in town here. And we're lucky to have OMAFRA, which is the Ontario um, uh, Food Ministry. Um, and we're working with them to build a code that works for our community and works for our space. So using biomimicry principles, it's very locally attuned. And we're figuring out ways to, to make something where people can sell their honey and safely distribute it without killing people or harming people. So my point is the small scale disruptions are super important um, and they're happening more often than not. And they're happening to big companies and big corporations, whether they like it or not. So if we can create partnerships where it's more collaborative, um, that's very helpful because it's, it's not a combative effort anymore. It's not, you know, the Uber telling taxis, you've got to change. It's like now they can work in conjunction to make a system that works symbiotically because we know that a forest naturally drives towards higher diversity. That's how systems naturally want to go. So how can we be more diverse and have my neighbors selling their honey um, and maybe another neighborhood in the city selling, who knows, beeswax candles, I don't know. But um, the point is, in, you know, support that disruption, but do it collaboratively. And I, I'm really fortunate Guelph has got um, a pretty progressive vibe to it. So the policymakers are, they have their ears open, which is great. Great, thank you very much. And um, Anne-Marie, I have a, a similar question for you. And, and that's the last question I'm gonna be uh, asking. Otherwise, Kira will get upset with me um, since we are coming up on the hour. So uh, last question for Anne-Marie, in a changing packaging culture, how does a law-based top-down approach meet a community grassroots approach in terms of concrete strategies? So similar question. Yeah, well, uh, there uh, was a lot of work done on that over the course of this year by, by this collaborative looking at how do we create the pull strategy? What does the consumer need to know in order to choose one product over another? Um, uh, and so I believe that more um, labeling type strategies are going to find their way into um, you know, the products in the supermarket sooner than later. And of course, when it comes to the, those kind of labels, you get into laws and what does biodegradable really mean versus compostable. Um, and so the definitions of those are gonna get clearer. Um, I think uh, you know, people are talking about um, how difficult change is at that kind of policy level and that collaboration is the key. And, and I think that we are going to need more of these um, industry-wide collaborations to have uh, a series of conversations uh, of stakeholders talking together in order to then inform the policy. But I think we need to start having, start, um, engineering uh, larger conversations on some of these issues uh, in addition to taking them uh, one by one at the local scale that Jamie's talking about. I think what I've seen through this packaging thing is number one, when you see all those brands in the room, you suddenly take the, your work more seriously. But when you see all those brands in the room, uh, you suddenly have a chance to uh, make a bigger change if you can identify the right one. So I think it is through collaboration. I would agree with Jamie, both at the small scale and um, at the larger scale too. Thank you very much. Super interesting conversation and great questions. Yeah, no, I have to echo that. I, it was great. Uh, thank, thank you all three of you for uh, joining the panel. It was a super interesting discussion. I could talk about this for weeks. So. Uh, hopefully we have uh, another opportunity soon. Uh, thank you everyone who uh, took time out uh, of their lunch break to join in and to ask great questions. And um, 
I want to pass it over to Kira. I know that's not in my schedule, but um, I want to thank Kira for uh, organizing this and putting all this hard work into it. Um, maybe Kira, if you want to, um, you have three minutes to take us to the hour and uh, maybe let people know about uh, our upcoming panel. Uh, I believe it's going to be engineering education, but um, Kira, if you want to show yourself, that would be great. Hello again. Yeah, so this is the first of a few panels that we're thinking of hosting in the new year. The next one has something to do with research and um, researchers and how they can collaborate um, within this topic of biomimicry. So you're welcome to join us for that. If you sign up for our newsletter, which is on our website, there'll be more information about that there, or you can follow us on social media and we'll be posting future events on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and what's the other one? Twitter. So feel free to follow us and you'll be able to hear more about what's coming in 2021. Thanks everyone. Have a great weekend. And uh, yeah, we'll stay in touch by all these media. All right, take care.